Hello everybody! Hello and welcome. I'm here for yet another exciting live reading from my fifth book, Shave My Spider. All about my travels around Asia with my wife Ruth. She wasn't my wife then, but uh, <clears throat> this is this is a rather large book. So what I've done, as I've said in other videos, uh, is just cherry picked a couple of chapters from each country that we visited. So, <clears throat> so what I think I'll do, I'm gonna I'm gonna read a bit about China now, and then I'm gonna combine the last two countries we visited were Laos and Cambodia. And in the book, they're much shorter as well because we, we sort of had less uh, actually going on in those countries and because <laughs> we were sick most of the time. Mm -hmm. So um, I will, <laughs> yes. So I will uh, I will combine those countries into one reading, which I'll do next week. And uh, most of it will probably be about us being sick. So hopefully you enjoy hearing about diarrhea and vomiting and other such delightful things. Oh, stop it. oh hey, you yeah. you've read my book, so you must love that stuff. Um, so that's next week and then I, I, what I've decided is I'm not actually going to read excerpts from my last book which is the uh, the prequel about my attempts to become a world famous actor <clears throat> and my failure thereof um, it's not really in the same sort of travel vibe and I, I wanted to do all this to sort of give people who couldn't travel during lockdown something to sort of have a smile about and stuff so rather than go there on that one I'll draw a line under this sort of series of lives that we're doing and um, have a think about what else to do next so last one next week is basically the short way of saying that uh, and that will be Laos and Cambodia <clears throat> so for now without further ado <clears throat> I will have a cup of tea Yes, and uh, <coughs> to my R2-D2 mug. Because I, I know you care about that stuff. Everybody cares about R2. And yes, and um, yeah, we saw we saw Empire Strikes Back last week on the big screen because of, you know, everything, all the movies not being released because of the, the impacts of the virus waiting. and that. I'm going to be waiting so, for the weekend. I'm waiting oh, for the weekend. Oh, you are. Maybe the week after. Ah, okay. I just remembered. Just, okay, breaking news, this just in. Um, Rue's going away again, camping again, um, yeah. finding more gold, hopefully, hopefully more than she found last, last time. Um, no, she's going away for um, a couple of days uh, next weekend, so actually I won't be doing another one next weekend. So luckily, when I was waffling, telling you all about next weekend, no bugger was watching anyway. Now, a few people have started to show up, mm -hmm. so this is the official version. Um, no mm -hmm. book reading next week. <clears throat> the week after, I'll do... Lao and Cambodia combined, and then we'll knock it on the head for a little while, and I'll sort of have a think about if there's, you know, anything else I can do. <laughs> so, that exciting business out of the way, let's get started <clears throat> before this becomes entirely me waffling about nothing. So, China was a very interesting, interesting country for us for a variety of reasons. Uh, my apologies as I'm reading this, if out of context, especially if anything comes across as slightly sort of xenophobic towards China and the Chinese people. But at the time, we were having a really tough few uh, weeks <clears throat> in the country, um, which was, I must say, almost entirely our own fault for going in so incredibly unprepared, which is what we do. And um, <laughs> that's why my disasters result. It's not China's fault, not entirely. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Even if it sounds like I, I feel that way a little bit in this book. So here we go. <clears throat> Training day. Trains in China have a hierarchy. The carriage class system is necessary to keep those who can afford comfort, as defined by their soft sleeper cabins, safe from the riffraff who were travelling with us on the hard seats. This was only the second worst class of ticket. There's a class system in the UK too, but in practice, that vaunted first class carriage is very little different from the rest of the train. The only major exceptions being that they have little lamps on the tables and power sockets, and that they're almost entirely empty. You'd have to be mad to fork out twice the price for such an insignificant gain in comfort. After all, it's not like you're going to be there forever. Most train journeys in the UK average about 40 minutes. The longest possible single trip takes six hours. Not so in China. This train taking us from Beijing to 
a place we've been reliably told was pronounced Chongqiao, was a 17-hour ride. That didn't even take us halfway down the country, though. There were at least three more similar-length trips in our immediate future. When we exited into Laos from one of the southernmost border crossings, we'd have covered well over 3,500 kilometres. That's like going the full length of the UK from Land's End to John O'Groats and back, and back again, and then back again. For my friends from over the pond, it's LA to New York and then about a quarter of the way back again. It's quite a long way. And in hindsight, it was rather ambitious on a 30-day visa. Getting onto a train in China should be made into a game show. Thanks to our helpful taxi driver, we'd arrived half an hour early for the train, but it was clear from the scene in the station that most people had been there much longer. Blankets were spread out, sleeping bags were being put to use. It goes without saying that every chair in the hall was taken, but by the time we arrived, most of the floor space was as well. Many people had tiny little plastic stools, like short folks used to reach things in the kitchen cupboards. I wondered about the popularity of these things, as they seemed to be on sale everywhere. And now I knew. With less than 15 minutes to go, there was a palpable air of excitement. The makeshift camps were being packed away. <clears throat> Crowds were starting to form around the barriers and station officials had to be deployed to hold them back. People from the back of the hall surged forwards, building the pressure. All eyes were on the mouth of the tunnel. Minutes ticked down until the barriers were removed by the station staff at considerable personal risk. And then the whistle blew. <clears throat> now, we'd experienced the notorious Mongolian scramble but China's population is 465 times that of Mongolia. It's like comparing a garage sale full of old women with handbags to a World Cup football riot. Fervently wishing we'd been able to afford a GoPro, we inserted ourselves into the seething mass of people and were carried along by the current. It was only afterwards that we realised this was a mistake. What we should have been doing was using our superior size and weights to our advantage, forcing our way through the throng to reach our seats first. Because there were roughly 2,000 seats on that train, and approximately triple that number of people aiming to get on. And luggage space for around 200. By the time we found our carriage, it was already rammed. To add to the fun, some genius had decided to place coat hooks directly above the numbers that labelled the seats. With personal space at a premium, every hook bristled with hats, scarves, handbags, jackets and shopping bags full of peanuts, through which we had to route to find out where we were. The next challenge, once our seats had been identified, was to negotiate with the people already sitting in them. They, along with a couple of thousand others, had purchased standing-only tickets and were fervently hoping they'd managed to occupy an empty seat for at least part of the 17-hour journey. I can't figure why they'd try this, as I'd never seen a single free seat on a Chinese train, and typically every inch of space down the aisle, every patch of floor, the gaps between the carriage, even the toilets is taken. So we presented our tickets, and the offenders eventually struggled out of their seats against the flow of people getting on, ending up propped against our seats anyway. I had to strategically employ my elbows to remind one of them that my ticket price included the right to put my head on the headrest instead of his arse. We paid for our reticence in the boarding crush by spending the journey with our rucksacks between our knees and our carry bags on top of them. My bag in particular is rather large, so straddling it felt like riding a hippo. It also caused my leg to occupy the aisle rather than the minuscule space in front of my seat, which made it a serious impediment to the hordes of people straggling up and down the carriage in a never-ending stream. What the hell is with all these people? I growled as for the hundredth time I pulled my knee up to my chest to let someone pass. Why can't they just be content with wherever they're standing? I put my bag in the aisle to give my leg a rest, just as a stewardess arrived with her food trolley. Oh, you've got to be kidding me, I moaned, before hauling the bag up onto my knee. As she pushed the trolley past, I noticed it contained almost entirely pot noodles. Who the hell is she selling those to? I asked Rue. Anyone dumb enough to forget their lunch, but foresighted enough to pack a flask of hot water? The two oddities dovetailed neatly when I battled my way down the aisle in search of the toilet. In the cubicle where I expected to find it, instead there was a counter with a massive steel urn and a gaggle of passengers filling their instant noodle cups with steaming hot water. I was amazed. And a bit embarrassed that I'd already unzipped my flies. Mm -hmm. I had to refasten my trousers and find my way through two more carriages to find a crapper, but there was a giant urn in every single one of them. I got back to find my bag occupying my seat as yet another stewardess forced yet another trolley down the aisle. Figuring if you can't beat them, join them, I forked out for two pot noodles with what looked like Paddington Bear on the lids. I couldn't read the labels, of course, but I imagine it said something like real bear flavour. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do with those? Rue asked once our airspace was free again. 
Just watch, I told her, heading back the way we come. I'd come. Wait, she called. You're not going to pee on them, are you? <laughs> a few minutes later, slurping our urine-free noodles, we felt quite civilised. It even occurred to me that I could have made coffee in the empty cup, had I but known. All that would inevitably result in another battle towards the toilet. Certainly, it altered our snack packing habits. Instead of substituting on bags full of chocolate and squash sandwiches, we knew that in the future we only needed to bring a pocket full of change and some napkins. I now consider freely available hot water to be the first miracle of Chinese trains. The second miracle is that no one is severely burned by scores of people struggling up and down the aisles, clambering over luggage, feet and prostate passengers whilst carrying a pot noodle brimful of boiling water in each hand. I became quite skilled at this myself eventually, though I never dared try it with more than one at a time. Our bellies full, we settled down with Rue's tablet to watch an entire series of something I'd downloaded by way of founding some use <laughs> for the internet devoid of Facebook, YouTube, Twitter and all blogging platforms. This time we'd picked Game of Thrones. We'd missed the latest series as we hadn't had English language TV in months. Ah, TV. It makes a 17 hour journey feel more like 12. However, any action which adds enjoyment to a train trip has an equal and opposite reaction. In this case, it was the weirdest one yet. A woman in a conductor's uniform made her way down the carriage, stopping beside my chair. I reluctantly pulled my rucksack onto my knee again, and she carefully placed the basket she was carrying in the resulting space. Then she took a deep breath and began screaming. I nearly soiled myself. She waved her arms for attention, still screeching. Every eyeball in the carriage swivelled to fix on her as she reached down into the basket by her feet. From the volume and the shock value, I half expected her to pull out a machine gun and start shooting, but she didn't. Instead, she produced a small white towel, brandishing it above her head as the noise continued. Was she surrendering? I realised she was speaking, only at such a high pitch and volume that it barely differed from a scream. What was going on? Was some kind of disaster about to befall the train? Was this our emergency safety briefing? Then, not bothering to pause for breath, the woman produced a bottle of water and poured it onto the carriage floor. Bending, she swiftly mopped the mess up with the cloth before presenting it to the train again. She wrung the cloth out with no effect, then held it out for inspection to the nearest person. He took the cloth, staring at it in awe, and suddenly everything fell into place. She's... she's selling those cloths! Rue breathed in disbelief. What the...? I noticed the basket by her feet was stuffed with cellophane wrapped packages. Oh my god, you're right! The amazing wonder cloth did a circuit to the entire carriage, passing through every pair of hands at least once. The woman did not shut up for a single second of this time having somehow mastered the art of breathing through her nose while shouting continuously. I honestly couldn't have talked for that long about my entire life to date, so God knows how she found so much to say about a friggin' sponge. I don't think she sold any, but it was not for want of trying. An hour later, she was back, this time assaulting our eardrums with a deafening presentation on universal phone charges. It was like living in the shopping channel with the volume stuck at 100%. Over the next several hours, we were forced to sit through 120 decibel sale pitches for mops, a light and sound toy train, woo woo, a screwdriver with interchangeable heads, magic trick puzzles, wooden bead necklaces, and of course, the unbelievable, incredible, amazing wonder cloth. Again. Because of course, not everyone was going all the way to Chong Chow. Some people were getting off halfway, and for everyone that got off, at least three more people tried to get on. None of them had seen the cloth yet. A student-looking lad sat opposite her for a couple of stops. Where from? he asked me. Australia, I told him. Ah, Australia. Where you go? Uh, Chong, Chong Chow, I replied confidently. I'd been practising. Ah, uh, he looked at me like I just said we were going to tell each other. Uh, it, it spelt Zheng Zhu, I tried. Then I gave up and handed him my ticket. Ah, you go Xing Shou. Well, shit. If even the locals couldn't agree on the pronunciation on one of the biggest cities in the country, what the hell chance did we have? And now I'm going to flip forward a little bit to a story that a few people have asked me to read about uh, going to Huashan, one of the five sacred mountains in China. Mm -hmm. Oh, actually, no, I'm not. Mm -hmm. Is that review? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yes, this is a... This is a slightly different one. Mm -hmm. Oh no, no, this is, this is yes, this is the beginning of the Huashan story. I'm sorry, it's, I write long and complicated books. It's easy to get lost. Oh, <clears> like travelling, maybe? Yes. Getting high. 
Sometimes people send me things. Since publishing my first book, I seem to have acquired a, a reputation on the internet for being a daredevil. No idea how, as I still faint at the sight of blood and I jump three feet in shock every time a car door slams. Personally, I, I think people are confusing bravery with stupidity. For example, I regularly walk out in front of traffic, not because I have no fear of cars, but because I'm usually thinking about something else and I don't even notice I'm in the middle of the road. Mm. Back in my university days, my friend James was the first person to notice this trait. We used to walk back to his house after class and he, he would save my life on average three times per journey. Mm -hmm. It used to amaze him how once I started talking, all of my other senses were completely tuned out. I hung out with him for three years and I still don't have a clue where he lived. But anyway, that doesn't stop people <clears throat> from sending me things, pictures and videos of the world's craziest bastards tackling the world's craziest challenges, usually accompanied by a note saying something like, you should totally do this. Mm. And without a fail, I always really want to do them. Mm. Huashan is one of China's five sacred mountains. I first came to know about it when someone forwarded me a blog post entitled The Most Dangerous Hiking Path in the World. Now, I defy anyone to read that and not think, dangerous? Pah! I'll show them. Well, that's how my mind works anyway. Rumours recently started deleting this kind of email. <laughs> <laughs> At least a decade ago, a random bloke who had never been to China started collecting accounts of people who had climbed Hua Shan. He turned these stories into a hobby blog which was filled with alarmist statements and third-hand reports of alleged deaths. The blog became quite a fixture on the internet, doing rounds of Facebook largely because of one incredible photo a pair of staircases, both vertical, carved into the rock about halfway up the mountain. With dangling chains to help pull yourself up, these impossible stairs had become synonymous with insane adventure when the legend of the world's deadliest hike was born. Mm -hmm. Back when we decided to travel Asia, China hadn't been on the cards, but we were desperately wanted to see the Great Wall, and when I'd added China to our itinerary, Hua Shan had been my one condition. <clears throat> Lying in hotel beds in Vietnam and Mongolia, she'd voiced her concerns time and time again. Always I'd replied by telling her that we'd wait and see. If Hua Shan was doable, we'd try and do it. If it became too difficult, well, we'd stop doing it. And if it became dangerous, well, that's what travel insurance was for. Mm. Not that I'd bought any travel insurance. Mm. I'd thought about climbing Hua Shan and about those crazy stairs for months. I lusted after them like a drug. Because they were there. And other people had climbed them, and more than anything, I hate feeling left out. After today, I wouldn't have to worry about any of that. Because today, at long last, we were going to climb Hua Shan, the most precipitous mountain under heaven. Which I took to mean it rains a lot there. First though, we had a chore to take care of. <clears throat> We'd visited Shan's central post office twice already on the advice of our hostel staff. Both times it had been closed showing once again that if they didn't know the answer to one of our questions, they merely told us what they thought we wanted to hear. This time it was mid-morning, mid-week, and the place was bustling. I'd done everything I could to wrap my Mongolian prize knife up safely and send it back to Australia. I'd wrapped it up like a birthday present and packaged it with a few bits of clothing we no longer needed. I placed a note in the box addressed to Australian customs, explaining that the knife was wrapped to fool Chinese customs and paid $20 for it to be sent by the cheapest method possible. Circus was stamped on the parcel proving that even government officials getting rubber stamps made up don't bother to have the text proofread first. We caught the bus to Hua Shan from outside Xi'an train station as planned, but before we arrived at our destination, the conductor gave a long and angry sounding lecture in Chinese. Ru and I looked at each other and hoped it wasn't important. Then we pulled up outside a cafe and the rest of the passengers bolted inside and started chowing down on noodles. We dawdled on the pavement, not sure what to do. The conductor barked at us a few times, made an emphatic you're in or you're out gestures, then gave up and pulled a sliding door closed across the cafe entrance. What just happened, Rue asked. I'm not sure, but I think he's co-opted the entire tour and turned it into a trip to his brother's restaurant. Mm. Shit. Yes, quite. This was a bit of a bugger, as we were on a tight schedule to climb the mountain. We had a long way to go, and the place we were staying in for the night, the only place we could afford, was on top of it. So, with absolutely no advice forthcoming, and zero English spoken in the immediate vicinity, we did what we usually do. Wandered around vaguely, looking confused. Mm -hmm. Luckily, the 7,000 foot mountain looming over the town was hard to miss. We were on what appeared to be the main street, and it had distinctly an uphill direction, so we went that way. We passed shops and businesses and a car park with a huge brown tourist sign written entirely in Chinese. I pointed it out to Rue. You see, 
For all we know, that sign could say, this way to climb Bashan, tickets available right here, and free ice cream for foreigners. Mm -hmm. Yes, she said, but it leads to a car park. Well, true enough. The road terminated in wide stone steps, which we were climbed hoping to find a clue. It was like a treasure hunt, only with the added incentive that if we didn't succeed, we'd be sleeping rough on a park bench. Assuming we could find a park. What we did find was a small square in front of an ornately carved wooden gateway. This looks like an entrance to a temple, Rue said. And she was right. It was naff all to do with Hua Shan, though, which was a bit frustrating. Finally, Rue spotted a sign about the size of a car number plate on the side of one of the temple buildings, which said, Climb Hua Shan. It had an arrow on it, so we followed that down a lane to the side of the temple. It didn't look particularly promising, but after a while it turned a corner and we came to a row of ticket booths. This is it, I declared. We made it! Rue was also exultant, and we did a little dance to celebrate. Mm -hmm. Then we bought tickets and followed the path towards a mountain. We walked for about half an hour before we realised we were still in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. You see, th there are three ways up Hua Shan. The vast majority of people take the cable cars, even though a round trip costs $32 per person, in addition to the $20 scenic area entrance fee we'd just paid. The most second popular route, which we figured we were on, is the Long Path a steep six-kilometre hike ascending the mountain via paved walkways. I'd been referring to this as the boring way up. The third is the damn hard path, which is climbed only by the very dedicated and the very stupid because it's damn hard. It starts right under the cable cars and pretty much follows their route, except that in the place of giant winches hauling six-man gondolas up the mountain in six minutes, there are just stairs. Lots and lots of stairs. This path is compellingly titled the Root Intelligent Takeover of Hua Shan, which is probably why everyone calls it the Soldier's Path. Mm. And that was the way I wanted to go. Bollocks. We retraced our step to the raised area outside the temple. We were quite literally back to square one. It's fair to say we were a bit pissed off at this point. Faced with no obvious alternatives, we wandered past the brown sign into the car park. A couple of guys were manning a barrier, and out of desperation I approached them. Hua Shan, Hua Shan, I said, waving my hands over my head to mime cable cars. The two men exchanged a look that transcends language barriers. Why do we always get the crazies? Mm. Much frantic questioning and repeated pantomiming of cable cars finally conveyed the right impression, and they waved us in, pointing towards a minibus parked in the corner, which had a picture of a mountain on it. Oh, bloody hell! Mm. Rue, you know what this car park is? What? It's the shuttle bus station for the Hua Shan Visitor Centre. Ah, why did it take them so long to figure us out? Every Westerner who visits this place is going up the mountain. Those guys have one job, which is to put people like us on that frigging bus. Rune nodded her agreement. I think they just like watching you wave your arms about and go whoosh. The ferry bus to the visitor centre was empty, because by that time no one in their right mind was starting the climb. The rather expensive but compulsory shuttle bus from the visitor centre to the cable car terminal was similarly empty. Our timing was perfect. Despite everything that had happened that day, or perhaps because of it, circumstances had conspired to send us up this mountain at 4.30pm. <laughs> Entirely alone. The whole climb we only saw three people, and they were right at the beginning on their way down. I'd read that taking the more popular route could be like queuing up the mountain, especially at the weekends. Instead, Rue and I had the place all to ourselves. It was glorious. They weren't kidding about the damn hard bit, though. We'd be going for less than ten minutes when we had to stop, panting and wheezing. Thought we were fitter than this, gasped Rue. Me too, I admitted. But don't worry, we're nearly at the top. Are we? No. Bastard. I won't bore you with the next section. Suffice to say, there were steps. Lots of steps. Thousands of them. Tens of thousands. It was quite tiring, actually. But the view was spectacular. We stopped to catch our breath at every landing and took the chance to look across the hazy gulf of nothingness to the mountainside opposite. At times we had unobstructed 180 degree views of the surrounding landscape. I could really see why the cable cars were so popular. To be able to sit and stare at all that, effortlessly drinking in the forest, the lakes, the smudges of cities on the horizon. Pah! Where's the adventure in that? You know what we should do? I asked Rue. No, what? We should climb some more steps. My mind wanders when my body is busy, which is probably not ideal when I'm on a narrow staircase halfway up a mountain, but there you go. Mm -hmm. As the stairs stretched endlessly ahead of us, I began to marvel at the effort involved in creating this path. It had to be one of the most inaccessible patches of a mountainside in China, so ridiculously steep that only a staircase of stupendous proportions could get people up here. But then, how do you make that staircase? 
Why? With stone, of course. Massive great blocks of granite that must have weighed as much as a small car. I had the same feeling I'd experienced standing in front of the pyramids at Giza, that sense that without modern technology, what I was seeing was simply not possible. In the absence of tower cranes, what do you haul stone up a mountainside with? With a donkey? What if that stone is heavier than the donkey? Next, I found myself dwelling on the mountain's history. Originally, I'd assumed that the soldier's path was called this because it was so physically demanding, but now I knew different. The name Root Intelligent Takeover Huashan referred to a group of seven People's Liberation Army soldiers who climbed Huashan by this ancient forgotten route. At the top, they'd surprised a garrison of a hundred enemy soldiers, capturing them all. This must have made them rock stars with the army brass, though quite why it was necessary is a mystery. I mean, what harm were they doing up there? It's not like they could get down quickly. Whatever they were up to, it would make sod all difference to the rest of the country. It was like being at war in England and realising there's a hundred enemy soldiers stationed in a swamp in Belgium, and you're like, damn, we must devise a cunning plan to capture those troops. Or, you know, just leave them there. They're in Belgium. What are they going to do? Send an aggressively worded note by carrier pigeon? Finally, I worried about the depressing amount of disnification in evidence. At some point in the distant past, the same poor buggers who hauled stone steps all the way up here had also hauled stone balustrades for the more exposed sections. Now those ancient chunks of granite were getting a makeover. They'd been encased in cement, which was rounded off and had rough grooves scraped into it. Several sections were still wrapped in plastic film waiting for the cement to dry, but others had already been painted brown, turning the raw stone handrails into poorly sculpted concrete logs. It was heartbreaking. Some complete douche canoe in the Communist Party's high command had obviously visited Frontierland in Morecambe, spent half an hour in the queue for the rusty minecart ride, and decided to restyle China's ancient monuments after it. Epic fail. The most frightening thing was no, no one was trying to stop them. About halfway up, we finally came across the thing I'd been waiting for. The stairs. Yes, I appreciate we'd climbed a lot of stairs already. My thighs would be reminding me of that fact for some days to come. But this was it. The scene of that infamous internet picture, the ridiculous vertical stairs that scared so mu scared Rue so much it'd take me three months to convince her to come here. And now here we were. And they were closed. Like ladders, the slender staircases were carved directly into the cliff face. Fifteen, maybe twenty metres of sheer rock that could only be climbed by putting your toes into the shallow step ledges while clinging for dear life to a pair of dangling chains. They did look a little dangerous, but then that was kind of the point. It was a bit annoying that some health and safety minded bureaucrat has decided to close the most famous staircase in the whole country, but luckily all they'd done is fasten the handhold chains across the bottom of the steps. It was no effort at all to climb past them. And I figured I wasn't really breaking any rules. No striding, said this English language warning above the sign, as if striding was even an option. I have to admit, I went a little bit crazy. I've been fantasising about these steps for months, which in any other relationship would be grounds for divorce. I'm very fortunate to have Rue. Not only did she stand at the bottom and film me as I climbed up, and down, and back up the steps, time and time again, she also let me try climbing them with the camera. This resulted in the most boring video ever made. Ten minutes of me panting like a sex pest over shaky footage of my feet. Running on adrenaline, I explored every inch of those stairs. Climbing them was much easier than it looked. Every step was a tiny shelf cut into the rock. Enough space for my toes to rest, but that was all I needed. <coughs> Bless you. And as the steps were so small, each one only raised me a handful of inches, and the chains on either side could easily hold my weight. A couple of metres up, the steps were caked in dust, suggesting it was a long time since anyone had bothered to climb that far. Perhaps everyone else took the closed signs seriously. Ha! <laughs> More fool them. I made several ascents to the top of the biggest stairs, but could only get halfway up the other one, as the top section had been obliterated by a landing for a new concrete staircase, complete with faux log handrails. Oh, China, for shame. Finally, Rue advised me to stop. Otherwise, I'd probably still be there. Or bits of me would. But she made a good point. The light was starting to fade, and it wouldn't be ideal if night fall caught us on the side of the mountain. Was that enough adventure for you? she asked. Yes, I panted, for now. Right. And what's next? Well, I figure we're about half of the mountain, so... We climb some more stairs? Pretty much. Rue sighed. See, that's the spirit, I said. Aren't you glad I talked you into this? <laughs> now, how's the... Uh, how are we going for time? Half past. Half past. 
Alrighty, so I'll uh, I'll skip on. Yes, <laughs> skip on to the. So we've had trains. This is a bus. Mm -hmm. I like to cover all modes of transport <clears throat> mm -hmm. for completion. You know. <clears throat> Slumber party. Having been on several sleeper buses in Vietnam, we were pretty sure we knew what to expect from our 22-hour overnight trip to Lijiang. <clears throat> we were wrong. Vietnam may not be famed as a centre for advanced technology, but compared to China, they had freaking moon rockets. The Chinese bus, far from being a sleek, purpose-built modern conveyance, was a shitty old coach retrofitted with welded steel frames and plywood planks for beds. It didn't have pillows. It didn't have mattresses. It also didn't have a toilet, which was of some concern. Despite the best efforts of the doctors in the UK, I was back to peeing every two hours. Into a bottle if I couldn't find a toilet. So far, in nearly four months of travel, I'd managed to avoid this unique humiliation, but if it was going to happen, it was going to happen in China. I'd never seen a long-distance bus without a toilet, but before we boarded it, I bought a spare water bottle, just in case. The journey began quite promisingly. The driver sent us right to the back into what were either the best seats on the bus or the worst. Time would tell. I took the top bunk as Rue was afraid of falling out of it. A very real issue given the lack of seat belts or any other form of protection. Rue caught a couple of cockroaches trying to snuggle up with her, but apart from that, the bus was practically empty. At least until we crawled across Chengdu to a different bus station, where we sat for another two hours. By the time we left, the bus was so full there were people lying in the aisles. Getting out of the city took another two hours. It was endless. A forest of skyscrapers, the traffic gridlocked in between them, the sky a relentless battleship grey. In the bed in front of me, a shriveled old woman coughed and hacked, sounding like she was mere minutes away from dying of TB. Each sickening session concluded with her spitting a great wad of what had to be lung tissue into a small plastic bin the bus company had thoughtfully provided for just such occurrences. Well, she didn't always use the bin. She had a young boy with her, maybe five or six years old, and the two of them fitted quite well into their bunk, <coughs> unlike me and Rue who lay there with our knees up to make room for our heads. The first part of the journey was made on the freeway, and it wasn't too bad. The bus stopped for dinner around 9pm. We bought an eight-pot noodles and congratulated ourselves for coping so well with the journey. And then we set off again into the night and began the journey from hell. Leaving the freeway without slowing down, the bus climbed high into the mountains on roads not substantially wider than the bus itself. The train switched from relatively smooth asphalt to the surface of Mars, throwing the vehicle passengers all over the place. Before long, torrential rain engulfed the bus, but that didn't give the driver pause. He kept the pedal relentlessly to the metal, swinging around corners so tight I could feel the back end skid out. Never a good thing when there are precious precipices with a thousand foot drop on one side and solid cliff face on the other. Lightning blasted the mountainside all around us, the accompanying thunder so loud it shook the bus. Rubber tyres mean we can't be struck, right? Rue called up from below. I uh, never been entirely convinced about the physics of this. Yeah, th that's right, I called down to her, hoping it was true. We stopped in the middle of nowhere to take on more passengers, the driver caring not what whip that the bus was already chock-a-block. The newcomers obviously didn't have tickets and were simply bribing the driver, which is probably why he was keen to squeeze every last one of them on. We ended up with a bloke reeking of booze lying in the aisle right next to Rue, which had given which given the uncomfortable and narrow nature of the cots we'd been allocated, meant they were basically sleeping in full body contact. She was more than a little freaked out by this, so I offered to switch with her, just as the bus lurched off and began ascending once more. How big was this bloody mountain? We'd be going uphill forever. The road was so knackered the bus was shaking itself apart. I braced myself with all four limbs against the metal bed frame and the roof, but it was impossible to sustain. Every time I shifted position, a sudden jolt would throw me against the window or, on at least two occasions, right out of the top bunk and into the aisle, which wasn't much fun for the bloke lying there. But that's what you get for not buying a ticket. Gratefully, Rue hauled herself up into the top bunk, but getting any kind of rest was impossible. Apart from the insane angle of the bus up the mountain, the terrifying speed it was making and the sheer violence of its passing, she discovered something else when the rain got harder. Her window leaked. She quickly decided that sleeping in a puddle was the lesser of two evils, though, and learned to cope with it, whilst I continued to enjoy the company of the stinking Chinese stranger, who had miraculously fallen fast asleep and was snoring like the village drunk. <clears throat> it remains one of the worst nights of my travelling life, but dawn found us stopping at a filthy concrete shack which contained a long trough for us to piss into. It was the toilet. 
After seven hellish hours without one, I didn't give a toss that twenty Chinese men of assorted ages stood and stared at me as I peeved. It did make me wonder about the quality of the female facilities, though. One look at Rue's face as she climbed back onto the bus told me not to ask. Now, I'm generally quite a positive bloke, and when things go bad I tend to say, it could always be worse. This bus journey was the exception to that rule. I didn't think it could possibly get any worse. Until the old woman, who'd been spitting into the bin all night, shuffled back on. The young lad she'd been travelling with hadn't got off the bus to use the toilet. Instead, as we looked on in horror, she encouraged him to drop his pants and piss into the same bin. He was less than three feet from my head when he did it, and that was where the bin full of piss stayed for the rest of the journey. Mm. The old woman congratulated him afterwards as though he'd been a good little boy. Suddenly, I needed the toilet again, and not to pee into. It's remarkably hard to vomit into a plastic water bottle. <laughs> I spent the next stage of our journey contemplating the stench as the driver pulled the bus up by the side of the road in the middle of nowhere and went to sleep in the aisle for four hours. Amazingly, against all the odds, exhaustion won out and I dozed off. I woke up when the wet patch from Rue's bunk started dripping onto my face. I was still three feet from a bucket of fresh piss. My bunk was vibrating in time to the old lady's death rattles and I was being spooned by the alcoholic tramp in the aisle. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I've had better. I've had better nights. <laughs> it's fair to say we weren't in the best moods when we arrived in Lijiang. When none of the taxi drivers hanging around the station would take us, a local woman waved us into a funky red postman pat van and gave us a lift. She was very friendly, chatting away, not at all concerned we couldn't answer her back. She unwrapped her lunch as she drove and must have noticed my eyes tracking her sandwich, so she gave me half of it. The kindness of strangers can go such a long way towards writing what's wrong in your world. It's such a pity there wasn't another half a sandwich for Rue. <laughs> Lijiang is a tiny place with over a million inhabitants. Sorry, I, I meant it's a tiny place for China. Mm -hmm. The old town was a bit we wanted to see. A UNESCO desert designated heritage world site. And one that has miraculously doubled in size since being awarded this status. Planning regulations have been put in place to assure that all the new buildings resemble the old historical buildings. Meaning... There's nothing short stopping you from demolishing a piece of 800-year-old architecture, so long as what you build in its place looks similar. It was happening all around us, with several rows of authentic 10-storey apartment blocks nearing completion, opposite the old town entrance. But I promise that's the last time I'll moan about China's approach to preserving their heritage. Bloody idiots. Mm. However, the preserved part of Lijiang is beautiful. It was based around three rivers, the buildings following them as they twisted and turned, resulting in a labyrinthine network of tiny streets with no discernible order. Getting lost is pretty much the number one activity in Lijiang, so after checking into our guest house, a delightfully restored two-storey courtyard house, we set out to do just that. The narrow alleyways bustled with local tourists, but here and there we spotted the occasional westerner. Cafes and souvenir shops lined the wider streets, swathed in ivy and bedecked with flowers. We ate all kinds of snacks from a wide variety of vendors, filling ourselves with noodles, fried potato twists, curry and steamed dumplings for considerably less than the price of one meal in one of the posh cafes. After this, we simply roamed, finding picturesque bridges, small squares that opened unexpectedly, and as we worked our way further from the touristy areas, more twisting, narrower alleyways where ramshackle brick buildings struggled to hold each other upright. Old women scrubbed their doorsteps and washing hung from upper storey balconies. Rue got so many photos, she got cramp in her trigger finger. Sadly, Lijiang was only a stepping stone for us. We passed one very pleasurable night in the Garden Inn Hotel, though we couldn't help but nip out to roam the streets again after dark, and probably spent more time outside the hotel than in it. The next morning, a taxi arrived to take us to the train station, squeezing through the alleyways so tight that we couldn't have opened the doors. The cars were banned in the old quarter after 6am for obvious reasons, so we were actually quite glad for our early start. Such a pity we have to leave, Rue said, staring out the windows as the old buildings crawled past at point-blank range. I know, I really like it here. The taxi crept around a bend and in front of us was the main road, already congested, heralding our return to contemporary China. If we'd been here a bit longer, we could have gone right to the top of the Jade Dragon Snow Mountain, Rue pointed to a single peak rising beyond the haze of modern Lijiang. Cool, that sounds like it would have been a challenge. Uh, not really, she said, it's got a chairlift. difference a day makes. Our brief stay in Lijiang left us feeling restored. Sure, we'd had some rough times, but from here on in it should be plain sailing. We had our tickets, supplied by the Chengdu traffic inn that would take us as far as Kunming, 
and from there we had only one chance task to accomplish, booking the bus out of China. The timing would be tight. I'd allowed two days from arriving in Kunming to departing on a bus we had yet to buy tickets for. This left us with a single spare day on our visas before we became criminals in the eyes of Chinese immigration. I was saving this day for emergencies. Standing outside the sweeping modern facade of Lijiang train station, I felt free, uplifted. Not only because we were on our way out of China, but because, for that brief moment, I felt quite content to be in China. Ruse by my side, happy and talkative, full of the plans she had for her photographs of the old town. We joined the queue of people entering the, conveyor, entering the station and heaved our bags onto the now familiar conveyor belts for the x-ray machines. I wondered if they'd ever actually stopped a genuine threat. Probably not. But they stopped me. Ru was struggling back into a rucksack when a rather severe looking lady pulled mine off the conveyor belt onto an inspection table. Her colleagues called out to her as she peeked into the various pockets. Then she opened the velcro pouch attached to my rucksack's waist strap and pulled out my other knife. Oh no. It was my pen knife. A small folding one with locking blade. It was what we used to cut cheese and salami for our picnics. I'd travelled <coughs> it had travelled with me for as long as I can remember. Always there on my waist strap through country after country. I'd carried it through at least 20 different airports as part of my checked-in baggage. It had been around the world twice. It had been fastened to my bag throughout the length of China and no one had commented on it once. And it was the first Valentine's Day present that Rue had ever bought me. I am not losing it to some damn Chinese bureaucracy. No, no, the scanner lady was telling me. She opened the blade and pointed at it, shaking her head. I sighed. Look. I argued with her for some time, getting nowhere because she had about as much English as I had Mandarin. Rue was getting nervous, so I sent her to join the crowd shuffling through the ticket barriers. Get on the train and save our seats, I told her. I'll have one last try at sorting this out and then I'll come to you. Mm -hmm. You promise? she asked. Of course. Okay, but don't try anything stupid. Mm -hmm. I won't. Turning back to the woman, I tried a different tack. <clears throat> What's your name? Write it down for me. I pulled a pen and paper from my data. Eh? 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 I want to complain to your supervisor. I need your name. Oh, no, no, cannot. You can write your name here now. I need it to complain. No, cannot, she said, covering her name badge with one hand. Then get your supervisor. Mm -hmm. She left with the knife and I stood there, eyeballing the rest of the x-ray staff for what seemed like an age. If the supervisor didn't show soon, I was going to have to abandon my attempt and make a dash for the train. Then a slightly older, immaculately groomed lady emerged from an office and came towards me. I am sorry, she said, her English sounding far more confident. You cannot take this knife on the train. But I've taken this knife from Beijing to Chongqiao to Qian to Chengdu on many trains. Every time my bag was scanned, no one else had a problem with it. Yes, maybe different there, but here you cannot take. Mm. But why? Because it can be used as a weapon. It's very dangerous. Are you kidding me? It's a pen knife and I'm on holiday here. Do you really think I'm going to stab someone and spend the rest of my life in a Chinese prison? Mm. Yes, not you, but someone can take the on the train can take. I promise that no one on that train is going anywhere near my bags. I keep them very close and safe. Oh, you don't know. Maybe you're sleeping. It's too dangerous. Look, I'll wrap it. Or you wrap it. Use tape so it can't be used. Mm. No, sorry. Cannot take. I'm not leaving without it. Cannot take. I was getting nowhere. Mm -hmm. Waiting for the supervisor had cost me valuable time. Rue had disappeared, along with all the people waiting for our train. The tunnel leading to the platforms contained only a solitary ticket checker, cooling her heels. At a sudden moment of revelation, this knife, sentimental as it may be, was just a thing, a possession. In the grand scheme of things, it didn't matter at all. Whereas Rue was up there somewhere, alone, on a train bound for Kunming, almost certainly starting to panic. Announcements had come and gone over the PA system. I had no idea what they were about, but it was a good guess at least one of them was a warning of imminent departure. Rue would be as upset as me by the loss of that knife, but not nearly as upset as <laughs> she'd be if I missed the train over it. Time to go. OK, OK, I told the woman, keep the knife. It cost a hundred US dollars. Maybe you can sell it. I grabbed my rucksack, swung it onto my back, and pulled my laptop bag in, in, on in front of me. Then, the dreaded backpacker turtle, my least favourite mo mode of travel, slow, ungainly, and an obvious target for thieves and pickpockets, I waddled across the empty station concourse and flashed my ticket at the lady by the barrier. She snatched the thing off me and stood it intently, which I thought was a bit unnecessary. Then she thrust it back at me and yelled in my face. Mm. I ignored her. Now was not the time to fight the language barrier. Mm. Whatever her problem was, she would have to deal with it on her own. I made a move to pass her, but she blocked my way, still jabbering at me. Mm. I glanced around. She was making quite a scene in the otherwise empty station, and the few people still around were staring at us. Mm. No matter. 
I strode on, shrugging the woman off as she grabbed my arm. She was definitely agitated about something, but I couldn't deal with that right now. Just get to Rue, I thought, that's all that matters. The woman was screaming into a walkie-talkie as I set off down the tunnel. I could feel the ground sliding out from under me, a sense of vertigo I get when things suddenly go horribly wrong. What the hell is happening? I glanced back to see her gest gesticulating frantically towards the staff of the x-ray machines. Another announcement droned out any sound she was making, and I recognised a word coming. Oh no. Rue was about to be transported halfway across China on her own. I had to get to that platform. I was speed walking down the tunnel as fast as possible, and as I turned onto the ramp up to the platform, I noticed a group of people in uniform doing the same about 20 metres behind me. Only they were armed with automatic weapons. Mm. Shit! Mm -hmm. I had no idea what was going on. But someone must be pissed off about something. Mm. It was a race now. As long as I could get to Rue before they confronted me, we could straighten this all out. If they managed to collar me before then, well, shit was going to get complicated real fast. Mm. I had no... I had... I had all the details of a hostel in Kung Ming. Rue would have had no idea where to go, and no way to contact me since I had the only phone. Mm. And the bastard thing still didn't work. Mm. She had all the money, every single yuan, and our only bank card tucked away in her purse. She also had every scrap of food, every mouthful of water, and I had her passport. Words can't even begin to describe how utterly buggered we would be if, we, if she was on that train when it left, and I wasn't. Mm. Halfway up the concrete ramp, I broke into a jog, I swung around the banister at the top and surged onto the platform, adrenaline pumping. The row of carriages beside me stretched off into infinity, but they weren't moving. Doors were standing open here and there, so I still had a chance. I took a break from scanning the carriage numbers to check behind me and immediately wished I hadn't. A pair of what looked like SWAT troopers were giving chase, charging down the platform towards me. I passed a window with 13 in it. Our carriage was only three cars ahead. With a little choice, I accelerated, running like a drunkard with the weight of the rucksack swaying me from side to side. Just don't. Fall. I was close now. I'd passed the midpoint of the previous carriage and there'd been no whistles or obvious signs of imminent departure. I was going to make it. An angry cry sounded behind me as I came abreast of the right door and hauled myself up through it. By some miracle, this carriage wasn't yet crowded and I pushed my way down the aisle with minimum commotion. Rue wasn't hard to spot. Her brightly coloured hair, her pale face and the terror ripped large across it. All these were visible from the other end of the carriage. I bustled up to her, dripping sweat, panting from my exertions, and grabbed the back of the chair opposite to keep myself upright. I'm here, love! I gasped. Mm. Thank God for that, she sobbed. Mm. But I've got a bit of bad news. Her eyes went wide, and then focused on the uniform officers storming down the aisle towards me. Tony, mm. what? And that was when they grabbed me. Mm. Later, Rue told me it was possibly the most scared she'd been in her entire life. Mm -hmm. Sitting there in what was already approaching blind panic, she'd been treated to the sight of me leaping aboard the sprinting length, leaping, leaping aboard and sprinting the length of the carriage, closely pursued by two Chinese policemen armed with machine guns. Mm -hmm. Quite how she maintained bladder control is beyond me. I was collared from behind and hauled round to face the officers, mm -hmm. and by then the lady from the security barriers had caught up. Her high-speed jabbering produced one recognisable word, ticket, so I held it up, somewhat crinkled and slightly soggy from being in my hand during my 100 metre sprint. The ticket was snatched away, carefully scrutinised and then thrust back in my face. No, no, was all I could make out, shouted by the security woman in town with her finger stabbing the ticket. No! I shrugged. I was past caring. I was back together with Rue and whatever happened, we were going to stay that way. This woman could shriek and yammer all she wanted, but unless she found a better way of convincing me what her problem was, I was determined to stand there making puzzled faces at her. Mm. Then another pair of uniforms joined the party, including the supervisor from the x-ray machines. I could hear Rue's sharp intake of breath when she recognised the woman. Mm. Oh, God, Tony, what did you do? <laughs> Love, I have no fucking idea. Mm. And then a much calmer voice ended the conversation. The x-ray lady was a higher level of authority, and she clearly had more practice at this sort of thing. Your ticket, she told me. It is no good. What? I bought it yesterday from my hostel in Chengdu. But it's no good. It's already gone. What? I don't understand. This ticket... Is for train already gone? Ah, uh, day before. I blinked. Then I studied the ticket more carefully. Amongst the boxes and boxes containing microscopic Chinese characters, it had the date on it. It had yesterday's date on it. Mm -hmm. We'd been screwed. Mm -hmm. I only buy yesterday, I told the lady. Can you change it? It's no good. I know, I understand. Can you change the ticket for today? Change ticket? No, train is full. Mm -hmm. I looked down at Rue. She was still sitting in her allocated seat looking horrified at this turn of events. Mm. Poor girl, she was reaching her limit. 
and about to be stranded here for another night, all longer, with no accommodation booked, nowhere to go, and every possibility that if we missed this train, we'd be too late at the border and would end up illegally overstaying our visa. Mm. Fuck it. Mm. I am staying on this train, I told the woman. I don't care about the ticket. I paid for it, so I'm staying on the train. Mm. You can sort this out however you want, but if you want me off this train, you will have to drag me. I knew she didn't understand most of what I was saying, but I hoped the tone would convey my message. I was pissed off, and I wasn't going anywhere. The train gave a lurch, nearly knocking me off my feet, and Rue put her arms out to steady me. Mm -hmm. Uniform types exchanged glances, and a high-speed debate ensued. The train lurched again, and I could hear the heavy doors being slammed up and down the platform. Again, the woman tried to demand something of me. One last attempt, at which I just shook my head. Then, as the cops turned and made their way back down the train, she followed. Mm -hmm. The sight of that heavy, armed posse retreating was my happiest for some time. I don't think I'd taken a proper breath since they grabbed me. Now they turned and scowled at me from the far end of the carriage, each waiting their turn to climb down the steps to the platform. Mm. Somehow, I had made it. Mm. We had made it. Rue marvelled at the sight of the officers, clustered around the woman in heated discussion as the train pulled away. I unfastened my rucksack and collapsed into the seat next to her, mm. sweaty, trembling mess. They kept the knife then, she asked. Mm. They did. I was suddenly too wary to imbue the words with emotion. Thank God for that, she said. Mm. Eh? When I saw them chasing you with guns, I thought you'd grab the knife and made a run for it. Mm. What? As if I'd do that? Mm -hmm. I'll never know with you. And they were chasing you with friggin' machine guns! I know, because my ticket had expired. Talk about overreacting. Mm -hmm. I thought you were going to prison for sure. Me too, for a minute. Mm -hmm. Please don't leave me again. Not ever. I won't, my love. I promise. Mm -hmm. She was silent for a few seconds, breathing deeply to calm down. When she spoke again, there was a quaver to her voice. Tony... Why does this keep happening to us? <laughs> and that's it for now, guys. I'll leave it there. I cannot believe how much happened. <laughs> it's funny. As, as reading through um, the stories to get ready for this earlier on, and I, I was just, I was just, it was melting my head the amount of things that happened. I was talking about when we, um, yeah. we lost our bank card on the way to. Uh, the Shaolin temple to watch the monks and, and it was like we, we had a horrendous journey there we got out and the got bus lost was, was yeah, the, the right bus place. dropped us off in the wrong place we spent about three hours desperately walking around trying to follow the GPS on the phone mm -hmm. and couldn't find the hostel finally after passing the local police about three or four times they picked us up in a milk float took us on a ride around town and we spotted the hostel we got into the hostel mm -hmm. <laughs> Didn't have any money. Oh, the hostel was full. It'd be fully booked, double booked. So they transferred us to another hostel, but that one didn't take payment by card at all. So they sent me to a bank to get money. I put the only bank card in and it got swallowed by the, by the ATM. <laughs> I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> Finally, we got taken up to the hostel only to find that we were the only people there. It only just opened. And um, in, the, in the room we'd been given, they had an ensuite bathroom, which was entirely glass. It had no no curtains, it had no anything, it was just just glass. And Rue was like, I really need a poo. And we were like, well, the bathroom's just glass, what do we do? So I had to lie there facing the other direction while she had a poo. <laughs> it, was glass. it was like, they had this amazing idea to come up with this incredibly posh, they must have sit in some high-end hotel somewhere where they had that privacy glass that you press a button and it, and it goes opaque or something. And here they, they'd done the same thing, but just with regular glass. And we're like, who in the world wants to, wants to stay in a hotel room where everyone who goes to the bathroom gets an audience? It was just like, it, it, what goes through their minds? But anyway, that was, uh, and that was just in one day. Yeah, it was all like that. And the next day we uh, we nearly <laughs> we were trying to post my 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 knife home and nearly yeah. got. Yeah, and we tried to see the Shaolin monks, but we couldn't quite make it in time. Oh God! <laughs> Went all that way for nothing. <laughs> anyway, very, very exciting. Right, that is all for now. And as I just said at the beginning, uh, it's going to be two weeks until the next one because Rue is away camping next week. So, now. yeah, hopefully she will find lots of exciting treasure and we'll be rich next week. So I'll be, you know... Gold sovereign. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, if she sounds anything exciting, we'll bring it back and show you. Or she'll bring it back and I will show you. <laughs> but other than that... Thank you very much, guys, for tuning in. I hope you have a really nice rest of the day or night, wherever you are, depending. Um, have fun and stay safe. And I will be in touch in a couple of weeks for another video. Bye.